I was recently in Cape Town and got to sit down with Dan Mace, who's the chief creative officer of Mr. Beast's philanthropy channel. So he is an absolute genius at getting YouTube to work properly. We're talking millions and millions of views. All the content he makes is superb. He's been in front of and behind the camera for very many years and knows his stuff. So if you're interested in getting your own YouTube channel up and running, this is the one interview you need to hear. No, just hit hit record whenever and we'll just start. Is, is it recording here? I don't know how this shit works. Are you gonna stand there, Carl? In that little space. Oh my God, we put on your cardio thing on your watch. But, but there, there was always people. Yeah, there were always people. There's people, the producers in the background and there was always marketing people running Should around. We, I mean, we had like 20 people. Have, have we clapped? Have we? Go for it. So, oh yeah, I wanted to ask, you know, like, when you would say something funny mm. and then someone's laughing, but it's, it sounds like it's purposefully further away. <laughs> is it done like that or, or are they just like well, in another room? So we used, to, we used to mess with theater of the mind stuff because in radio you can create, I mean, this is always the problem, right? Is that imagination yeah. is in everyone, you could tell the same story to 100,000 people and each one of them will see a different picture in their head. Sure. Which is great. It means you don't have to have Hollywood style special effects in order to bring about like dragons and monsters and fire and fucking brimstone and all that shit. But we, we, I tried to make it as real as possible. So I especially made the producer sound like he was talking through the shittiest microphone because he was. That's, what was his name? Damon. Damon, so we, we put him, right? he, had, he yes. was in his own booth because he also was big and fat and he smelt and he never, <laughs> never looked after his personal hygiene. And uh, he was, he, I mean, I, if I sent interns in there, they would come out like, because he fart and carry on. Wow. And man. it was real. So it was, it's exactly how he was. So we just tried to show the audience what was actually going on. And you don't need to, because you're there three hours a day, five days a week. You can't really bullshit. You can't act, yeah. you can't pretend, because eventually the act's going to fall apart. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's part of the fun. So when he would like, because either it would be like super close to the no, mic. No, no. It, or was, it, was, it was permanently turned far too high up and then gated down so it didn't ruin everybody's radios when they're listening. Uh, okay. But that's how, because he's also, he was annoying. He still is annoying. I mean, he's a great guy, but annoying. He came with you yes. from, from when oh, like, you left radio and decided he did. to podcast. He did. So we, we had a nice team there. I still speak to all of them. Um, and they all had a role to play, but it wasn't like a scripted role. Mm. They, were, they, were, they were brought like on that. because they were real people yeah, 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 who came yeah. from completely different backgrounds, had totally different opinions. Some of them were more soft and kind of quiet. Some of them were loud and annoying. And I was trying, it was like playing with a, a cast of characters where you don't actually know what's gonna happen next. And part of the fun was that we didn't know what was gonna happen next because it was three hours where we literally would switch on the mics and then things would happen. Mm. And it was fantastic. I mean, it was, that, you, you never get bored in a situation like that. That's like how uh, yeah, YouTubers copy that format or utilize that format where it's, if you create characters that are recognizable, mm. they don't have to play large roles. They just, they, they people return because they're like, oh, I know that. Yeah. And it, it makes it much easier to bounce off people. I saw my, my nephews watching these guys called the Stokes Twins or something. The Stokes twins. Uh, oh, this kid, they're kids. They're like, oh, okay, you know, my yeah. nephew's like nine or whatever. It's these, these two guys. You probably know in the America. Stokes twins. Do you know them? Okay, well, these two guys, and I mean, like, I don't even know if it's appropriate for kids to be watching this. Oh, I, dude, I'm no. not the father, so I'm, I'm, I'm just the uncle. So I watch these kids, and they are absorbed by these guys just doing normal stuff. You were saying just now, when you get into the, the Ubers or whatever, yeah, the guys yeah, ask yeah. you what you do. They're trying to make conversation. They don't really care, but yeah, you yeah, have to yeah, answer. Sure. So what do you say? <laughs> it's like the, the, an internal debate of going like, do I explain that I'm a YouTuber? Oh. And then they go, what is that? Or I go, I'm a film director. <laughs> and they go, what movie did yeah, you yeah, make? Yeah. What famous what, movie did yeah, I yeah. know? Yeah. Because it'll like, definitely be a movie I know. Which Marvel movie yeah, did you yeah. make? Yeah, and you're like, fuck. Uh. <laughs> and then if, it, if you say you make YouTube videos, then they go like, but how, does that, how, how, how do you, do you make, make money? money? Yeah, mm. what, what is the thing? But in the States now, you can go, I'm a YouTuber and they go, that's fucking cool. You know, what, what's your channel? 
Like that's of the course. Level, no, it's, yeah. it's, it, but what you're doing here, and this is why I'm excited to actually talk to you today. I mean, I want to talk about all the philanthropy projects because I saw just a while ago that nothing you do is good enough these days. You can go and actually help people find right, yeah. running water for the first time in some part of this planet which is completely uncared for by governments. Mm. And instead of people going, wow, that's a really nice thing that you guys are doing, they start giving you shit about it. Mm, mm, mm. And not people who are there. They're obviously grateful for whatever you've done. Yeah. But like act some slacktivist in their mom's basement at yeah, home in yeah. like Louisiana in, in the US is like, I don't think it's right that you're helping people. And, and they're yeah. doing nothing for anyone, but they have an opinion. Yeah, yeah. I, like when I started at Beast Philanthropy, I used to dive into the comments and oh. like read... But now I don't at all anymore. The, it's not worth and, it. Like the first round of comments are generally very positive. Those are the, you know, your core following, your core fan base, and uh, it's it's quite funny because sometimes comments come in. The film is ten minutes long, then you get a you upload it, and within the first ten seconds you get like a oh, what an amazing film. But they, ha they, they haven't watched, watched it. Ten, ten, no. Yeah, they haven't watched it yet. Yeah. But still, very grateful for the for the audience. Um, but the, the negativity, you know what, at the end of the day, it surges views, definitely. Sure. And it gets your attention that you would have never got from people who are actually not interested. And 100% of the proceeds from any income stream, so whatever we do on the side of Beast Philanthropy goes back into the project. So right. it will either go into the food bank, it will go into the actual project that we're busy with, if it's building an orphanage, if it's building wells, if it's uh, donating shoes. We did a project where we uh, gave away 20,000 shoes in Africa. Amazing. And it was, but still, so you think that's amazing. Yeah. Right? There's still people out there that would say, um, we're taking away jobs from people that make shoes. So we don't, you read a comment, or from our side, we get to read a, a, like a static comment, right? Sure. You used to have people phone in. Oh yeah. And so you get to hear this per like, and you hear the tone of voice, and they're really angry about something you've already moved on from. Oh yeah, so, so I mean, and you would say like pretty controversial shit, right? <laughs> so you must have had like a lot of people that phoned in, and they were like really triggered about something that you would have said that was like just well, that they disagreed. Uh, so, with. So so you said you used to listen to the show, which I mm. appreciate enormously, but things have changed a lot. I don't think I could get away with half the things that I said in. 2012 in 2023. Oh yeah, you would so be cancelled for I'd be, something. I'd be, yeah, I'd be yeah. in huge trouble because sure. everything these days is controversial. You wake up in the morning, you go, wow, what a beautiful day. And there's some asshole mm. who goes, it's not a beautiful day. Who you're, the fuck do you think you're you are? You're a dazist. Right. Yeah, yeah. And now you're like something absolutely middle of the road like that is going to get you noise and, and discomfort. Mm -hmm. And what really drives me crazy is all these people in marketing all mm. over the world <laughs> who are there to look after their brands. They're like mm -mm -mm. spin doctors mm -hmm. by any other name. And they think they can avoid this stuff. I mean, eventually it's going to come for everyone, right? Yeah. Like the internet is not built for you to avoid risk. Some point, sometime, someone's going to come across your content and they're going to mm -hmm. go, I have a problem with you. And they're going to do everything in their power because it's their moment to shine, mm. to pull you down. So I just want to talk about you for a second because apparently like you started with this stuff before YouTube was a thing. Mm. Like as a kid, you were in a commercial or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you weren't like a child actor or anything. No. Did, were your parents pushy? Did they put you into that? <laughs> I, I don't actually, well, I think, you know what? When I was like, so I'm a twin. Okay. And my what does twin the other one sister do? and I, she's a top tier lawyer. Oh. We are like polar Brilliant. opposites. Brilliant. Yeah. So, we were in like a lot of catalogs when mm. we were kids, you know, like, like child, like we had model child. Did you make money? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I was actually phoned my mom. Did like, your wait. mom just bag it? Yeah, I don't know if there's some compound interest growing somewhere, but I haven't seen any. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, they definitely used it to pay for schooling, I guess. Okay. Um, and then I was around, I must have been like 14, 15. I had this long blonde hair. I used to think I was like cool as fuck, you know, yeah. back then. And uh, I got this, I used to go to castings all the time. And then I got this role in a McDonald's ad 
Um, and I remember seeing the camera crew and just thinking like the camaraderie between the way that the director spoke to the DP and the DP spoke to his AC. And it, it was this, uh, it's like a small little ecosystem and everybody knew what these terms meant. It was kind of like surgeons all like communicating yeah. with one another. Yeah, like their own language. And I was so intrigued by that. Um, immediately then and there, I was like, I want to do that. I didn't know which thing I wanted to do there. I knew there was a guy behind a camera. I didn't know what he was called and knew that there was this guy telling me what to do. And there was a woman standing with a clipboard or everybody shouting. Yeah. Um, and I just thought, shit, I want to do that. Because uh, it is it is harder to find people who want to be behind the camera. I mean, everybody thinks they'll be great in front of it, right? Nowadays, yeah. yeah. Well, with YouTube, and a lot of people are. I mean, let's let's also be fair. Like we have, there's so much more opportunity now for really talented people to do their thing. Yes. But to find the people who can make them look good, yeah, yeah. and really, and and the post production on these things is massively important. And being able to conceive of the idea and actually communicate that, because it's no good you just roll camera and expect someone to just do their thing. Mm. I mean, you can do that. Some, nine out of ten times you might even score, but that's, that's one I time. That's why I TikTok. Yeah? Because it may, people are so clever. People are so funny. If you ever scroll through the comments on TikTok, like, sometimes, like some people are really ruthless, but they're hilarious <laughs> copywriters. And they're not <laughs> copywriters. They're not hired yeah. by agencies. Sure. But TikTok has given... Um, creators the ability to not have access to any of that stuff and they're hilarious you know you've got like there's thousands of people on tiktok that are just they found some sort of niche like there's this guy that i follow that goes and he like uh narrates he's canadian and he narrates these videos of himself like cooking food <laughs> in the wild okay and i love it it's so intriguing for some other reason and he's got this like really thick Canadian accent and I watch it like every morning and it makes me excited and happy for the day for some weird reason but it's filmed like really shit but it's the kind of content that I want to consume but look at how much things have changed too and I mean you're on record saying that you don't need expensive equipment and you no, don't no. need you don't need a ton no, of look at all this. <laughs> you know but you don't I mean this this is an impressive setup and <laughs> We're doing this because I said I wanted to come down and interview you and you, you said, oh, well, we've got the studio. You're gonna, and I mean, this is phenomenal. And you've got a team of guys who obviously know what the hell they're doing mm. and that, that helps. But you don't need a lot of equipment or no, no. even a lot of experience to pull off the content winning game, right? Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, you've either got it or you, or you, or you don't. So like the, the thing is, is people, I get the question like, um, I want to be a YouTuber. Or I, w I want to be a content creator. Like, how do I become a, a content creator? And the harsh truth to that question, like, ugh. if you aren't already, are you ever going to be? I mean, <laughs> it's it's like I I try and say, you know, <laughs> my goal was to be a professional surfer. Okay, I got myself so far till I realized that I just wasn't good enough. Um, and at the end of the day, like having access to all the tools being just your cell phone nowadays yes there's a large part of the people around the world that don't have access to those tools that could be great a simple cell sure. phone a simple wi-fi connection um but if but, you have but, access but it, but to but it's those so things, much more available than it's ever been and i mean it's like people say for example i i really want to be a master at this thing and i i often say to them well there's the internet, which has more information than we've ever had access to in all of human history, and it's all available to you at virtually no cost. But instead of going on the internet and researching what it is you care about, you're busy like scrolling through TikTok and watching porn and gambling on sports sites. And yeah, yeah. there's no one stopping you but you. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and with YouTube, or in the case of shows like Idols, which I've done, people say, how do I become famous or become a singer or become a broadcaster or whatever, I say to them, well, if you really wanted to, you'd already be doing that because the barrier to entry is so low already mm. that there's no real excuse. I mean, you could always improve. Everyone can improve. But what you're saying is true. Like you have to have, first of all, the, you have to be willing to put in the effort mm. and you have to be curious enough to get better, to want to improve. And if you don't have those two things, mm. it doesn't matter how talented you are. Yeah. And you can find your place within the industry. So... If you want to enter 
the world of YouTube and go, look, I want to be the next Mr. Beast, right? Like, that's my goal. That's my end thing. And you've been trying every single day and it's just not working. Um, you can still find your place in and amongst that creative community. Sure. You can be a part of the process, but maybe you just not cut out to be that person in front of camera. And that sounds like so... Oh, it sounds so... It's, it's like you're... you're, you're well, well you, you, you're kind of... You're puncturing their dreams and... But at the end of the day... Okay, so... But, but if they're asking you, they surely want an honest answer. Yeah, and yes, for some people, it's, it's like the choice. Depends on the age. How, how you answer Yeah, I mean, you're not, tell, you're not going to tell some 14-year-old who's like yeah. really enthusiastic, <laughs> no, like, no, no, don't no. bother with this. Go and become an accountant. But they're 14 <laughs> and, and they still have the chance. Like, you know, I get some like... 35, 40 year olds asking this question. And the, the, there's a spectrum of, of art and commerce, right? And that's where we sit here. And, and especially coming from a traditional world of, and when I speak to traditional, I speak all, old media, which is- oh, you, under, you, you experienced that in early age. So you know how the old studio advertising exactly, agency yeah. model used to work, right? And now we want to, so for me and my, my ego and, and all these kinds of things, I want to hold onto that artistic element. And, and YouTube really, uh, there's, a, there's a constant battle internally with going, okay, I want to make art or cinematic films, but they're not commercially successful. And sure. success on YouTube is is simple metrics like views and, and engagement sure. and, and your average view. It's duration. a numbers game. And so you're going, okay, how much of my creativity am I willing to abandon to pay the bills? Mm. But in this in this case, you're going, um, how much of my time am I <laughs> that I'm willing to spend with my family yeah. and uh, <clears throat> and how I'm gonna abandon all of the stuff, I'm gonna sell my car. I'm gonna take a mortgage out on the house because of my goal of becoming a YouTuber. And if you've reached a, a certain age and it hasn't happened, I would say stop and do something else. Maybe it's time to give up that dream. And, and that's okay because as long as you fail fast, you can find something new that maybe is your thing. And then before you know it, you're hugely successful at that. People often ask me as well. And, and I wanna to get to something you said just a second ago because there's something about that which makes me very happy because I'm always having this in a dialogue too about, yeah. you know, so it sounds like I'm schizophrenic, but how, how much do you want to do what you want to do because you believe that it has merit and will gain an audience? And how much are you being told by other people, no, that's not how you're going to get an audience. Do it this way because it's an algorithm and there's no, uh, it's pay to play mm. and content doesn't matter and you must give up on that dream because actually these days it's all just a computer that's figuring out where the, mm. where the eyes are going. And it's, <laughs> it's like you take the soul out of it. But when, when people ask me, how, how do I do podcasting? I always say to them, either do, I mean, always do what, you, what you're really interested in and what you care about, because otherwise you're going to run out of steam very quickly. But mm -hmm. you can go in two directions. Either do something nobody else is doing, which is getting harder and harder. Cause Way hard now. There's a niche for everything now, yeah, right? Just... So... Either do something no one else is doing, impossibly difficult, but there are ways, mm. or do it better than anyone else is doing it. And those are the only two options available to you. And I'm sure the same goes for YouTube. And to do things better than other people are doing it, especially if they've been doing it a long time, they've already amassed an enormous audience, and they're learning new things along the way. They're already years ahead of you. Mm. And because they're learning things while they're at that stage of development, you're not gonna catch up easily. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there, there's a, you have to constantly reinvent yourself nowadays. Like the relevancy thing, mm. I've seen it with a lot of uh, close friends of mine that, that have been YouTubers that have been stuck in a certain way and they mm. go, this was working yeah. and I'm still gonna go. And you're just watching views drop down and drop down. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, it's not, all about the views, right? But there, sure. there's a there's a baseline, um, and I mean you can have it as a hobby. Yeah, yeah, but you need you to know? pay the bills, and you need to keep. But if but if you're relying on it to pay the bills, especially if you've got a very small audience, it's just not realistic. Well, yeah. So your audience trickles off, and the 
YouTube algorithm starts to realize that your average view duration is going down, so they're not pushing your videos to mm-hmm. as recommended to other people. So it's a vicious cycle downhill. The honest, uh, if that's happening to anybody that's listening to this or, or watching, and, and they've, you know, the the. The, what you Don't should cry. do. The, no, no. The, <laughs> the solution to that is to actually start a new YouTube channel. Really? Yeah. If your YouTube channel wow. has dropped off completely and you're sitting at the bottom, it's almost impossible to get it to go back up. So people are, and the same thing with TikTok, like people are creating multiple different TikToks and, and it's really weird. They're putting out the same videos um, across 30 different TikTok uh, accounts and some pop off and some don't. And then they use the ones that are popping off. It's, it's really strange. But with YouTube, if you've told YouTube that your content is shit, regarding from the viewer's point mm. of view, they're going, I don't like this anymore. It's boring. It's redundant. Um, you just decelerate really fast. It's going to be way harder to come back up. It's much better to reinvent yourself, start a new YouTube channel from the beginning. And if you're good, you're going to grow super fast. And what we've seen with um, vert- what we call verticals, just shorts. Yeah. Um, shorts are ways in which to grow your audience very, very quickly. But now it becomes the debate between subscribers versus views. Because then if you're looking at what they call long form, what I, I understand as long form, which took me a while to get into, long form means feature films. Right. Long form on YouTube just means a, a video that's longer than like three minutes long, four minutes yeah. long. Uh, short <laughs> it's form. It's a very broad category, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so in long form, so people that are getting 25 million views on their verticals and they've got 6 million uh, subscribers, they put out a long form video and they get 10,000 views. So the subscribers aren't... Wh- which which equi- makes, I mean, is there any... Um, any di- differentiation from a purely commercial point of view, which is preferable? Which which is which is the the, the real prize? The subscribers or the views? Views and lo- but, longer. But form your time there may be a very short window period. On, on shorts, like the the way in which to make money um, through short form content is very difficult because you, you're going to want to pivot into other income streams so you're mm. going to want to sell merch you're sure. going to want to, but you can develop a large level of fame um, the amount that you're getting from brand deals is significantly lower mm. than what you're going to get on a longer form video as well as with a longer form video you can spend more time with the audience people that are really really good at creating short form content um, and I'm not taking away from short form sure. content it's an art of its own we I mean for myself I, I struggle with that place because I go it's all uh, the art of reduction, but it's also, it's, it's so simple, but yet formulaic? it's super clever. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's the problem when it comes to being a filmmaker because the options are, are widely open. So you go, okay, well, I can make a film about anything and everything. Um, so the enthusiasm on the subject matter that you're dealing with is probably not as high as somebody that only knows about one thing. So if it's a person making short form content about knitting, they're really enthusiastic and interested is interesting. Yep. So if you've got like an, an older lady like knitting and she's getting super excited about some sort of cotton, you're gonna watch that and be like, fuck, this sure. is really yeah. interesting. I don't know why I like it, but I like it. It's the same as- uh, It's like that dude with the trains. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that guy, like, even even my dad, who's like seventy, yeah. I showed him this video. He was mesmerized. He's like, "This guy is the he's most." Ins- at, ins- at yeah, yeah. He's got that terrible head. camera, that you can see, like, <laughs> yeah. and he goes, "Oh, I'm so excited What's about his name? this train." Pull up his name quick. Francis. It's Francis. Fra- Fra- God, he's he's fantastic. And I mean, he, who would have thought? Like, because Francis. Bush, but, you, but you see, he's he pivoted off to becoming. Um, but he was on what cover of what magazine? He, he also, he did like a whole campaign with, who was it? Like, uh, uh, um, what, what's, uh, it's huge. I don't, I, the, it, was, it was Gucci. Is yeah, it he did Gucci? A, he did a massive Gucci campaign. He's a very good looking guy, but he, <laughs> he, he makes himself look ridiculous. But he, interested is interesting. Yeah, I totally and, agree with you. A lot of these things are, 
age old, you could have spoken to someone on TV in the 40s when it was still just a, an emergent thing in America and they would have been saying things like, interested is interesting. Yeah. This is not revolutionary, but, no. but the format allows for such amazing variety. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of it is formulaic because you also have, there are ways, and you know this way better than me, and this is why I'm kind of getting a bit of a masterclass in all of this from you now, but there are ways to kind of keep people's attention for longer. Sure. In scripting, in editing, in what you put up on screen, all of that stuff. And you guys learn the tricks of the trade. Mm. And most people who are watching are not even aware of some of this stuff. It happens so subliminally. Yeah. But it keeps you going. And then before you know it, you've spent three to four minutes watching something. Yeah. So I always look at it and I go, if someone comments um, props to the editors, that's bad. Oh, really? Well, they've noticed you don't want the them editing. To, yeah, you don't want them to pay attention it's to that. Pulling them away from the story. Um, there, there's certain things if people come to... Oh, it's not bad. Maybe it's because the person who's picked that up is a professional themselves. Could be. And they, they see something of real yeah, sure. creative value. But I, I <clears> see <throat> sometimes I pick it up. There's a, a lot of comments, I would, a string of comments, I would say, that, and a lot of likes. Hmm. And yeah, for my ego and stuff I'm like fuck yeah bro editing <laughs> but then you've got to separate that from going but then people were pulled away from actually being super involved within the story and the narrative and maybe it's a comment that was made after that but the, a comment that goes this was transformative or um, they utilize a, a name that of a character that was in the film. They, they you can see they were immersed person. in it. They they yeah. really loved what was going on. They were they they weren't trying to analyze it from the outside. It's the same thing with the music. Um, we we compose all, all the music. It's it's um, Jason Wendy um, who composes music. He works for Joe. Um, so all the films are originally uh, on, on originally. Originally, originally, yeah, originally. Why am I yeah. fucking up that word? Uh, original, originally, originally, original, yeah, or, or originally <laughs> from they originate here. <laughs> they, they <were> <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> scored, oh, or originally, originally scored, originally scored. Is yeah. that the way that you yeah, yeah. say that? Shit? Yeah. I've never said it like that. Hmm. They are so scored it's, it's, originally. it's not you're not using library music or anything, they, origin- yeah. <laughs> they are scored. Oh. Originally, yeah. Fuck, that sounds weird. No, it anyway, makes sense. so they, they uh, this originally original music that's it's created for originally. every single. Yeah, yeah. Um, fuck, where was I going with that? Oh, oh yes. So even for for the music, if somebody comments about the music, then you know that they've recognized the music, which is even worse than the editing. <laughs> music should hide in the background, but it's for me. Music is. So what's the most important thing? The story. The story comes first, but the story is amplified by music. Um, with our, I mean, you must know this with radio. I mean, you've heard the same four chords. I mean, how many times? Yeah. And it's just been but, transposed. But, but people also are, are guided by the music emotionally. Yes. If you're playing sad music, they start feeling sad. Even if they're not paying attention to the story and before they know it, they are roped in. If there's like, a lot of action and it's hectic and the music is the same. It kind of gets their heart rate going and they don't even realize that the music yeah, yeah. is playing a huge part in that. But you don't want them, in your opinion, paying so much attention to that that they're actually trying to figure out how the joke is made uh, yeah. or, or how, the, how the sausage is, is, is put together in the kitchen, which is a horrible process. It's, it, you want them to just enjoy the finished product. Yeah, yeah, so, sausage in the kitchen. Yeah, sounds that's quite horrific. Yeah, I mean, we made a few sausages. No, but they, they, there's a famous <laughs> saying about if you, you know, if you go into Part the kitchen the sausage, to see how the sausages no, are made, no. you don't want to eat them ever again. Oh, gross, no. Right? Yeah, I haven't heard that, but it, no. I've, it's, uh, yeah. it's kind of like the- um, I think I've watched that actually fourth wall. TikTok. You kind of don't, the, the, the audience, because we've, we live in an era now where media is so authentic and immersive and, and, and out there that people are being their best mm-hmm. selves mm-hmm. and all that stuff, that we've removed the desire for people to go on a fantasy journey. And I can't help thinking that the success of things like Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, which are monster mega mm-hmm successes in such a way that even before they've been commercially bastardized by Disney, Mm -hmm. the fact is people are escaping into those things because 
they are the antidote to all of this reality that's happening around us, which is a fairly novel phenomenon. I mean, before, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, even reality TV had never existed, mm -hmm. where they let you see that was, this is actually a production. You could get into the fantasy of it before. Mm -hmm. Now, the only place you can get fantasy is in fantasy. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's almost robbed us of something. Sure, yeah. Um, but let's not, let's not again get so analytical that we leave everyone behind and they go, what the hell are these two talking about? Yeah, no, it's, in, it's interesting. There's so many versions. Of what, do you, what do you hate doing that you have to do when you're making stuff for commercial reasons? And you can tell me because I'm not going to set this up to piss off anyone you have a relationship no, no, with. No, 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 but no. I, I there are things you. like I often feel when I'm selling something too hard to the audience because there's a, yeah, we have clients and we have, some of them I love. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that stuff, I always feel, oh, this is prostitution. So, yeah, there's a, it's, it's difficult because one part is um, we rely heavily on, on the brands that support the videos. Sure. Right? Um, and we've been really lucky. So on the beast philanthropy side of things, the, Clients, uh, uh, the brands that have have stepped on board to support the videos have have really put the they they've let us kind of guide the way in which we product place their dream client. Brand. Those are the best people to work for. And I I believe who are they? I mean, no, like th these are people who yeah, deserve credit for giving you artistic freedom. Well, there's there's a, electric e bikes is a, a company that has right. sponsored a lot of our videos. This guy Levi is incredible, awesome, and, and a philanthropist himself, and. So I think there though, because it's, it's tied to the Beast brand, people trust right. Beast and they go, well, and this is the ideal client and the ideal agency at the end of the day is somebody that goes, this YouTuber, this creator clearly understands their audience the best. So I'm not gonna sit at my desk and write these shitty ass lines yeah. and go like, I want you to say this exact thing. Cause we'll look at it and go, Nobody's gonna fucking uh, convert. It's not gonna, no one's gonna click on the link. It sounds like an interrupt. So if we going, usually a, a, a brand read would have to happen um, three quarters of the way into a video, which is nearing your third act. So if we going impact communication and then we, at the end we wanted uh, either in advertising you call it persuasion or we call it transformation in, in our right. videos. And the transformation releases the oxytocin, the oxytocin gets the people to then either donate or they feel uh, in our case with philanthropic work that they wanna go out and do good themselves. But now you go, fuck that, S subscribe to whatever the yeah. brand is or buy our clothes at this thing. And, it, and it's like someone um, asking for money after you've just had a really nice kiss. It's terrible. <laughs> it's like the word, yeah, yeah. So we, we've been lucky with that. But the, the worst part of the process when it, when I was making films for my own channel, which I've kind of slowed down now, mm. um, was that I, I didn't have the reputation of somebody that would uh, generate mass amounts of views in the eyes of uh, a lot of brands. You right. know, they would come on and they would be like, we have uh, X amount of budget for 50 creators and I'm one of those. And they go, we need these key search terms. So we need every one of them to say this shit and they're going to put it out. And I would try and, and put the brand in, in a clever way coming from an advertising background. Sure. And I'd get backlash doing it and they're like, just say the fucking lines. Yeah. Just say, just, it's right. there for you. We've already written sure. it. Sure. You know? I'm like, people aren't gonna, and you can see on, on YouTube on the back end, um, how the, with the, your average view duration, it starts off, it always trickles down in the beginning and then it, it kind of, what you want is a flat line, which mm -hmm. means you, you're holding people, the retention's there. And then as soon as the brand read comes, it goes uh, and it goes like that. And then it wow. goes back up and you go like, why do brands then put, wanna say this shit? But why do they also, why do they put people off so much? Because surely also, I mean, with, with our audience, I, I know that they understand that part of the reason we're able to do the stuff we do is because someone's paying for it. Sure. And, and largely, we don't see that kind of a drop off because I think there's an honest, like, guys, this is how we pay for the stuff so yeah, that yeah, we can yeah. give it to you for free. Th that's it. And right? with Beast Philanthropy, we, in 
none of our videos have we seen a drop off. That's amazing. People but, stay but, for but the But do you think it's because it's philanthropy? I think it's the positioning of it. We we cleverly place where it's put. So we we hold, because nowadays on YouTube, you can obviously just skip through and there's chapter mm. markers. So yeah. you can go with that chapter, there's a brand read. Um, so we try and make them entertaining somewhat or or it sticks in and we utilize music that way too. So we don't break the soundtrack. Awesome. So we'll move into it, but it'll never be like, just before the climax, just before you get there, like, and now bang, a word from yeah. our sponsors. Like, yeah, fuck. People will immediately. <laughs> That's terrible. They would turn it off, they, right. or they would get triggered, or they would hate the brand. Imagine you, the reason for ruining that person's feeling. Like That's right. You coming up and you like, oh my word, I'm just about to cry, and then suddenly so someone's talking about buying pillows or or shaving your face or, or whatever it is. But this is where I, I um I've got this ongoing like fight with. I think it's me versus the world sometimes, but I know I'm not the only one, where you are, accountants have taken over everything and God bless them. I love the accountants because mm -hmm. the market wouldn't work. We wouldn't be able to do any commercial deals. Everything would fall apart because we need the numbers people. But if they're in charge of absolutely everything, then all they're interested in is that ROI nonsense. And then, mm they will interrupt the story with the commercial because they go, well, that's where most people are most interested, so we're going to screw it up. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can't let them have control of that stuff. No. Because they're good at their things, just like you wouldn't ask, you know, the, the person who's come up with the best story or who's performing beautifully in front of camera or who is hilarious or like just incredible at communicating messages and things. You don't necessarily put that person into the office to do the balance sheet. Mm -mm. But they don't see it the other way sometimes. Yeah. I am. Um, yeah, I, I see this as being a struggle for uh, agencies that are used to the traditional realm. Mm. So TV advertising, right? Yeah. In South Africa here, yeah, uh, we had, in my opinion, the greatest ads. There's, we used it, to have. The, the, sure. No, yes. What yeah. I'm speaking of in, no. back in the day. Um, my favorite director uh, was a guy called Keith Rose. And um, I loved every single, he was the reason why I wanted, I've actually got this tattoo, or is it on this side? Which side is it? This that side. side. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's because of Keith. Um, and I love the way it's on your neck and you're not sure which side it is. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's when you know you've got, yeah. Um, but, so yeah, we had exceptional commercials um, and there's still exceptional film directors. Hmm. However, remember, people were forced to watch TV. Yeah. But back in the day, I remember s certain commercials being so good, we would flock to the you TV to watch the commercial, right. even to see it like 10 times, right? Absolutely. Um, nowadays with ad blindness and stuff, as soon as you see a commercial, you, you don't care. You go like, this is shit, right? So now agencies that, that have um, ECDs and copywriters and, and art department and, they, they, they kind of, um, they're in a space where it's, it's very difficult because they've got to put a lot of that power into the creator mm -hmm. because they're still, they're sitting there going, well, this is my title. This is my job. I understand the brand. I, they're in my account, Yeah. but they're going, um, fuck, I don't. I don't know how to sell to this guy's audience, but I've still got and this the, job. And therefore it takes trust. Yeah, and the, the trust is, is hard to pass over, but it's also, I, I think, in a, it's also a job security thing. Um, I, I really think that it's, it, it must be really difficult in certain cases where you go, well, um, this is how we want to position the brand, yet this creator knows how to position this brand better than I do. So let them do it. And to, to let go is way harder than to get stuck in. Yeah, and... Uh, okay, but I, I don't want us to sit here and like, again, make the sausages in the kitchen. Like, let's rather let people eat them and not know what ingredients yeah, yeah, go yeah, in yeah, some, yeah. some of the time. <laughs> so, I mean, again, going back to your story and, and working with someone like Mr. Beast who has, I mean, it's just indisputable that he has climbed to the very top of this yeah. new media mountain. That's crazy. And he's fantastic at it. And people just love that stuff. And they love the stuff that you're making 
because I think there's a congruence there. But you guys, I mean, you didn't know each other for years. It was like he was stuck here, what, before COVID or something or during COVID. And you guys ended yeah. up meeting and spending mm. time together. And then he like called you up and said, hey, do you want to do this stuff for mm, me? Mm, mm. I mean, it wasn't like you were doing nothing before that. No, 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 yeah. And we can, we can get into some of that too. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, the amazing part of this is that this wasn't part of your plan. No, 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 no. This and that, certainly not the philanthropy stuff. I don't think you thought that would ever be a part of the plan until it kind of you, you, you found it, it found you, and it must be very rewarding to do this now. Now it is, yeah. yeah. So just to unpack that, like, um, well, I'll start off at the end. And that before doing the philanthropy gig, I, I was no humanitarian or philanthropist. I, yeah. I don't want to say that I didn't care about philanthropy. But no, but you were, you were busy with other stuff and you were making things that you were interested in doing. Yeah, I just wasn't, uh, I didn't think, I would have liked to maybe, I, I hadn't even thought about being one day making enough money to be able to open up a charity, right? Like that wasn't even on the cards. I didn't think that way, mm -hmm. um, which sounds terrible to say, but fuck anyone that says that they think <laughs> otherwise. Do you know what I mean? I like, agree. There's no motherfucker no, and, and you hear these people who've like done nothing and they're like talking about giving back and you go, well, how can you start thinking about that when your own cap isn't even full and you're yeah. worrying about filling other people's cap? It's just nonsense. It's virtue signaling on steroids. S yeah, so I, I didn't... I didn't choose to go down this path. And then I, after the first job, because um, the camera is kind of used as a shield, yeah. you know, so you can easily go, and, and I come from a, a fiction background, yeah. um, and now we're in a, an unscripted realm, and you're also you're dealing with real life things, and you, there's a lot that you can't control. So I can't like tell people like, hey, come over here, it's a better shot, start crying. Do you know what I mean? No. It's like, the, sure. there's a, um, so to be a part of that, and you, you kind of fly on the wall, but you're also trying to get in there. So there's a lot of grappling with how far can I go. It's like filming animals, but you don't want to upset them so they don't kill the well, yeah, it's, impala. So, you know? so it's, very, it's very difficult. And it's, yeah, it's difficult territory that. And then you see the reward. Um, and then the real reward comes three months down the line when you, you receive a video from whoever it is that say, uh, with the orphanage that we built, Mama mm -hmm. Rosie. Um, and she sent a video with her phone filming the kids three months later and you see the transformation and you go, fuck, the, the reality of what was done there is, it's a real thing. It's a- it's Like a, unintended positive consequences. And you don't see, with other films, it's like, you know, you make a film, you move on and, and it's sure. forgotten about. Sure, you entertain people, but it's kind of a, it's a very transactional relationship. And this it's has like a long tail that is- It's forever, yeah. Absolutely. And we, so after that happened, then I was like, I'm sold in this philanthropy space. I, people have asked me, and I don't know why I've, maybe they've asked me this question prior a lot. But nowadays it, it hits home a lot harder when they go, what's your plans for the future? <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, I, re I just want to be doing what I'm doing right now. And I don't think I've ever said that before. And that's scary as hell because it's like- You're saying that now when they ask you? Yeah, yeah, I just want to do this. But I think that's phenomenal. So someone said to me a while ago that people get depressed if they spend more than 20% of their time and energy on the past. Mm. People get anxious if they spend more than 20% of their time and energy on the future. Mm -hmm. And the way to be happy is to live in the present. Sure. And I've always, I don't know if it was just intuitive or lucky, but whenever I've been in a relationship, I don't want to talk too much about the future or too much about the past because I'm actually enjoying the now. Yeah. And people who are super focused on the future and they're asking you things like, what is your future plan? Or, mm -hmm. I find those are anxious people usually mm. who are like, worried about their own next step, so they're busy quizzing everyone else about it, hoping to get an easy answer that you can copy paste into your own world. Yeah, it's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not healthy. It's, well, like, it's just like a random, And if you love what like, you're doing right now, yeah. keep it going as long as possible, right? Yeah, but there's, there's this like, now maybe this is cooking a sausage again. Uh, like it's all right. I can't have, but I can't have these kinds of conversations with a lot of people, so I'm yeah, happy yeah. to. And those who will listen, you say, I don't give a shit how many views we get on this. Yeah, yeah. I am 
I'm doing this for the people who are interested. In As you stuff. said that, I was like, "Fuck! I hope people watch it." That's just how how I'll train my. my <laughs> no, I'm mind. sure they it's will. So weird. I'm sure they will. But yeah, um, you were going to say going into the into the sausage making again. Yeah, I think that the better things are. So there's a lot of uh, uh, melancholy attached to the ecstasy of good shit because mm-hmm. you're so scared of of losing it. So we understand we wired to impermanence. So you know eventually, and, and there's are gonna... that there's that research that they keep on bringing up over and over again that we are more averse to loss, of course, than we are excited by gain. Yeah. So if you lose a hundred bucks, you are more pissed off about that emotionally. The the, the scale is this much. Then if I gave you a thousand bucks, you're only that much more excited than you are well, at rest. Ex- and the expectation moves further and it's further. Ter- it's terrible. It's like yeah. must come from evolutionary biology where we're like we're so excited to get away from the saber-toothed tiger, but if our girlfriend gets taken out by the saber-toothed tiger, we're much sadder for much like, longer. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's sad. <laughs> Terrible example, but Jeez, you get the yeah. idea. <laughs> well, it's like, yeah, it's the never ending. It's like the mirage of the finish line. Yeah. My, you know, if you... And it's so goddamned hard for you. Yeah. And for a lot of people in various businesses, but because you're judged and you are judged, the numbers come through on every video on every film you make, Mm -hmm. on every interaction you have with the market or the audience at large. And if you have three cuck ones in a row that Mm, didn't go deep, you get very, very unhappy, right? And then you put pressure on everyone else around you and you suddenly think, well, maybe we've lost our... Our Our mojo. So yeah, that's the... This happens to me. It's so scary pressing upload. Like that, that, so that's one thing. And also I feel the, the last 10% of a film is a, are the hardest part because of the fact, I think one is that you're scared as shit to release that film. And the other part is that you're finishing something. It's the finishing of a project and you're going to have to say goodbye to it and move on. And um, when we upload, YouTube gives you an hour grace period where it doesn't to change your mind. No, no, where it doesn't let you know where that film is sitting out of 10. So oh. for the amount of time that that film's been uploaded out of the last 10 films, yeah. it will tell you how it's performing versus the film three films ago, five films ago. Right. So it'll go, okay, well, this film's got 500,000 views in one hour. Um, but the film prior to this had 2.5 million views in an hour. So it says the, the, the worst nightmare is to get something that says 10 out of 10. That's like not, that's what you want at school. 10 out of 10 here <laughs> means that it's 10th out, oh, out of 10 films. It, right. is, it is the shittest thing that you've done out of 10 oh. films. Um, and we have a, th- there's a blue line like this. And it, so there's a gray area, it's quite thick. And that's your, where your average views sit. Mm-hmm. And then the blue line uh, would go either below that, in that, or above that. And what does it mean if it's below? If it's below, it means it's shit, it's bad. Oh. It's below your average, right? So we sit and like the whole team sits. So th- on on upload days, we know we're probably going to have no work done for the first half of the day because we're sitting there just checking, ch- checking, all the checking, time. rechecking, and it goes, it goes, because it fluctuates a little bit and suddenly it pops. And the the morale in the office, everything changes. I will be, if, if the film is doing shit, I'll be the angriest person in here. And we are fucked. Like the whole thing, you know, like we are, we need to change the whole way we, we're doing everything, you know? And then suddenly, and two hours later, it pops off and it goes like three out of 10 and then one out of 10. And it's like, fuck it, that was the that's great. That's awesome. That we should have done it. Yeah, that the feeling, last, is, that's unstoppable, <laughs> yeah. right? But your head lets you think, based on the performance right in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> I work with uh, the, um, the executive director of Peace Philanthropy, Darren, and he's, a very, he's become a very close friend of mine. He's also South African and we moved yeah, to the States. Yeah, you, you two both uh, are the only South Africans that are working for Mr. Beast all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I love Darren to bits. He, he's it's amazing the, how he, South Africans get in in all kinds of weird and wonderful places. We're making, we're making things happen, but not the way you'd think. No, well, yeah, so speaking to that, um, there's a guy called Nick Small, who's... Um, I mean, even Beast's girlfriend, Theo, who I interviewed the other oh, day. Oh, yeah, she's, yeah. She's fantastic. She's South African. I'm like, this, this guy's like, whether he likes it or not, surrounded by South Well, Africans. Casey Neistat, who I worked with, is yeah, also he, married to a South African. Didn't he introduce African. you to yeah, all of them? Yeah, he's amazing. married to a South African right. as well. 
Um, but yeah, I was, I was at a Kiffin, the, the Kevin Dave Scott. You've worked with him very, mine. very closely yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. So I was at a concert he of He just his. told me he was in New York. Sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And Whoopi Goldberg came yes, to yeah, his yeah. concert. And she said she's obsessed with those cat, cat music videos, videos yeah. he's making, which, I mean, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Just, yeah. And I mean, I thought they were cool before Whoopi Goldberg, but who would have known she was like a super fan of his cat stuff? There's crazy, like, there's <laughs> like, so I, I think he's, he showed that he puts on is revolutionary. The way yeah. that he does it, he does it in these different, uh, so he starts off with uh, vendors and then he does all the, the Coca-Cola and, uh -huh. and you know, all, all the, the singing vendors, like how we would know them, like <laughs> uh, genius. The, the guys that would walk on Clifton Beach selling the lolly. Um, and then he moves over to cats and then he moves over to dogs yeah, and he does, genius. he's like- But I, I did interrupt you, we were talking about Darren. No, yeah, but I think you said something about South, South Africans, Africans together. Pitching and up in funny Darren, places. myself, and this guy, Nick Small, who um, is doing exceptionally well in Hollywood. He's a, a South African from Cape Town as well. He's an animator and he's got his own yeah. show. Um, and Dave was on the stage and uh, Nick said to me like, isn't it crazy that, you know, that there's a level of success here and we're standing together and we're united as South Africans here in America. And we were in, um, in Los Angeles at a, a club that um, Red Hot Chili Peppers had oh, performed man. at. There was all crazy, it was like Metallica, Rolling Stones, insane. And Dave had booked that entire place out. Amazing. You know? And these people like, and I, he hasn't comprehended his fame yet. No. So he just walks but, around. But he's, he's so, I mean, he's such a humble, lovely guy. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think he's still, like he's still having and fun, like finding, and people send him cat samples. And he said, when I interviewed him just a couple of weeks ago, he's like, no, nah, I'm just having fun with this cat thing. But I mean, he's shooting the lights out. Oh, he's blowing up. Yeah. It's I amazing. Mean, yeah, yeah. He's doing so well. So yeah. To but Darren. Dar Darren. This usually happens. Don't with worry. These, um, so, fuck, what was I saying about that? You, we were talking about the philanthropy stuff and then you, you were, you were going to bring him in and explain something that you guys had figured out together about the sausage making. <laughs> is that a reasonable, <laughs> is that a reasonable recap? Um, I think, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you've firstly, lost it, just leave it. No, da Darren's like the, so he, he's the reason I actually joined philanthropy. So Jimmy okay. phoned me, um, Mr. Beast, and yes. he, he was like, um, look, I want to redesign the way that the philanthropy channel is going. You know, the, the films are, uh, I don't want to use the word mediocre, but the films aren't right for the, 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 the kinds of projects that we're doing. They're not- sure. um, There's room for improvement. <laughs> Let's, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I, I looked at the channel and I was like, you know, when you're we speaking about the art versus commerce thing and I was like, you know, this isn't really what I want to be doing. It doesn't look, I mean, like there was, t they were throwing down money and there was like explosions that was happening in, yeah. in their cuts and things like that. And I, for me, I respect that, but it just wasn't something that I'm into doing. Mm. Um, and then Darren phoned me. And to hear the conviction in this guy's voice, to hear how passionate he is about, like, I swear he, he lives his life for philanthropy. Like he, he will do anything for this charity. And he phoned me and spoke to me. He speaks a lot. And he phoned me and, and spoke to me for about two hours about the, where the channel's going, what's happening. And actually, Today, this morning, we just reached 20 million subscribers, which wow. is a huge pain. Congrats, man. That's fantastic. Thanks, yeah. And when we started, the, when we started. Nice coincidence that I'm here for this now. Yeah. That's great. Well done. And he was like, yo, we could get to 15 million subs or whatever by the end of the year. And I, I never, even, I thought that that was um, not ever going to happen. Hmm. You know, I was like, this is, this guy's it's deluded. Tremendous. Like, this guy's crazy. Like, who's going to watch philanthropy content, right? And at the time, just prior to that, I had moved off of YouTube and I was just about to make a feature film with Warner Brothers Discovery. And at the same time, sure. I'd, I'd spent a week with Renee Zellweger um, at her house and we had co-written this film. So we were gonna shoot Amazing. in 
Jan- from January till Feb. And then I was gonna go on and shoot my feature film from Feb, March onwards. So that was my plan. And Jimmy phoned me and put the biggest spanner in the works. And Jimmy's the kind of guy- Did, goes you, have to, like, did you have to phone uh, Rene Zellweger and let it down? Yeah, <laughs> easy. I, I'm I went terribly through sorry, the, you Hollywood A-list actress. I know, yeah, just not I prepared to work with you. Something better has come along. <laughs> Fuck no! It was like I went through the the producer, this incredible incredible guy who, who was the producer on that. Uh, yeah, uh, fuck. Um, but can you can you pick that up, or is that that ship sailed? I don't know. Uh, it's hard to tell. Because a lot of this is relationships, right? Like it is. Further down cool. the line, there might be things that come up and you can because you'll also have started to bring in new people and handed on some of the stuff. You may be I'm sure to. she understands. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure that a bunch of things cross everyone's desk all the time and they course, they know yeah. not to get attached. Yeah. But, but, the, it, but the it was your is, baby is I was way, going, so were you attached? I was going like after it, like, you know, we have to do this right. film and we have to do it. And <laughs> then like- Well, like Darren put the energy in from a philanthropy point of view. Well, you, it was a huge span. You ha- but you have to put the energy in if you really believe in something. Yeah. Someone's got to drive it. And, and Jimmy didn't give me much time. <laughs> you know, he was like, you've come to Greenville. I think I've, I flew straight to Greenville from New York, um, which is where the Beast headquarters are, um, where all these studios are and stuff. And he was like, just come check it out and then give me an answer, you know? And uh, it all had to happen within like a week. Um, I think like the fir- he was kind of like in 48 hours, I needed to give him an answer or, or, you know, needed to let him know if I was gonna take on this first film pretty much mm. then and there. But I knew taking on the first film would mean that I'd have to cancel doing the film with Renee or push it out and then if I get hired full time, I wouldn't be able to do my feature film. Mm. And saying goodbye to that was, would have been ex- back then really tough because it was something I've been working on for two years and it's an incredible project. Um, and so I had all of these things going on in my mind. So I, I was like, I'm gonna take on this first project and then we'll just see what's gonna happen from there. And now I'm here, we've made 13 films. We've shot, I think 16. Um, What what were the the numbers like when you took over? They were doing like eight eight million views a video. And now we do, if we don't reach 20, we failed. Wow. In our our minds, you know, so we do 25. There's one of them sitting above 30. Amazing. Um, Yeah, and I remember being in the, I was at Darren's house and um, because the, the, the way we've positioned the films now are a lot more cinematic and there's a lot, of, they, I don't wanna say fatiguing, but they can become fatiguing because if you, if you come home from work and you switch on, on YouTube, we're finding a lot of people actually watching YouTube on TV now. Mm. Um, and you turn on, and, and you've got the option to watch something that's uh, on an entertainment level in the comedic route sure. or, uh, you know, it's, maybe uh, Jimmy's uh, main channel videos, which are the ones that people will divert to immediately watching because they are just crazy. And, They're amazing, and, and phenomenal. And he's, he's, he's a, I mean, this is why he's as successful as he is, but- And then why but, would you but, choose to- But you're competing work? against that, right? So, yeah. And, and, and yours, while the, the, virtue, the virtuous cycle of it is that by watching that, you're actually helping the next one to be made and those people to benefit from the philanthropy. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I, but, so, but you can't kind of hold a gun to people's head and say, out of guilt, you got to watch this. So no you've got way. to make it compelling. It has to, and that's the thing. And like, um, so Darren was like, look, I said there's going to be a drop off of views because the commercial side of things, if we're not putting explosions in it and not making um, jokes the whole way through or whatever, it's people aren't, it's not going to hold. And Darren's always believed in me, weirdly. Like he's always just said, don't worry, we're gonna, he, he said, we have to at least reach 10 million views a video by the end of the year. And I was so triggered by that. I was like, fuck, I've made the worst decision. Mm-hmm. I should have stayed in doing what I was doing because there's absolutely no ways we're gonna do that. There's no chance in hell. And the, sec- the second video we made, the shoes where we gave away 20,000 shoes, it, it went to 20 million views. 
And I was like, nah, that's, there's something, you know, that's a, an, an anomaly yeah, film. Yeah, Second one we did after that, um, did like 17 million or something. And then it went 25, 25, 25. And these things started. And then I'm phoning Darren going like, if a film's not going over 15 million in a week or whatever, I'm going, Darren, we are fucked. What's going on? He's like, bro, but you, you, told, you were fighting with me about 10 million about 10. views a few months ago. So that again, and, and a funny story actually, we made this film in Kenya and it wasn't performing like in the first week. Um, and uh, I was like, ah, oh, fuck. And immediately my, when we, before we upload the film, like this film is great. Mm. It's awesome. It's a great film. You put it up, it does bad it didn't views. And I go, this film sucks. This is the shittest film I've ever made. It's terrible. So I was in that mindset. And Darren was like, if this film doesn't get, so I think it was in like 5 million views, 6 million views, whatever. He was like, if it doesn't get 10 million by, if it, if, if it gets 10 million views by the end of the week, you have to tattoo my name mm-hmm. on yourself. And if, you, <laughs> if it doesn't, I'll tattoo my name on And here's the result. Right. <laughs> it got 20 million views. It was on like Phenomenal. 25 million views. Um, <laughs> so it just shows like he, he just knows that, that things are going to work. And he's, he's had this incredible belief in myself and the team at Joe. Um, and same thing as Jimmy, like in, in the beginning we were getting feedback, uh, quite a lot of feedback from, from Jimmy and him going kind of like, look, you know, he's a retention specialist. So mm. Jimmy understands mm. how to hold. So your AVD is what's most important on YouTube. So YouTube's looking at how long people are spending watching your video and then how, how long they spend on YouTube itself. So your video relates to that video. So they're clicking from there, they're going to uh, yeah. another uh, related video and so on and so on. And they, you've kept them there, but you were their entry point. So you're going to surge your videos higher. And Jimmy worked out all these mechanics of YouTube at a much younger age. And that's why he's so great at what he does. And he's just been reinventing. Jimmy understands the, in, the way in which the algorithm of YouTube works better than the algorithm understands itself. <laughs> that's you know, quite something. Yeah, he, absolutely. He, understands everything working with his team is is incredible jimmy looks at something he can tell you if it's going to work or if it's not going to work and i still don't know how he does that but he just goes make that change that needs to change that needs to be faster take that out you know and when someone like him gives you feedback you don't say no no of course <laughs> you go yeah oh f- fuck it yeah like, you know, oh. I, I thought that too right you know, that's i was just giving you this yeah, of a, course yeah, yeah, yeah. Option, like i'm totally on board option. with that that was um we were just waiting for you to okay it yeah and he uh <laughs> but now he's he's given us um you know it, it took a while so we would call it a hybrid version of content so taking in the cinematic elements and the on the musical side the the more um originally original scored music <laughs> and uh you know kind of guiding the audience in a very we've got a way in which we want to always our goal is to make the audience cry when they watch the films we want right. to really make them feel something and then the version of um beastifying which we call the video but adding the element of of this not not veering too far away from the beast brand of course and now that we found that uh, middle ground, probably halfway through this year, the reviews from him are, are minimal. He watches the videos and either he goes like, this is great, or he gives us a few little things to change. Then it goes to Darren. And Darren's the guy who makes all the changes because I still use all f- the in, in rhetorical devices in writing and, and, and filmmaking. So I, I use hyperboles and I try and make things like, as intense as possible. So you open the film and the impact that we use up front, I really dive into it, you know, to capture attention. But sometimes I might, may write things that are, don't really exist. And, and, your, and your sounding board is then Darren. Darren's like, fuck, you can't say that. Because you, you, you see, this is another real. thing that, that I don't think a lot of people who are involved in content creation really understand is you need to have one or two people who are not necessarily your boss, but they're people who you really value the feedback of. And oh, yeah. And you don't value their feedback because if you don't listen to them, it's going to go badly. You also don't value their feedback because you're afraid that you might have made a mistake. Mm. You're actually in this 
incredibly, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a mutually beneficial, almost like a, um, like, like those, those animals which need another animal to make something happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've forgotten the term for it now, but, but those things are massively important and there has to, again, be trust. Mm. Yeah, Darren is... You know he's not saying something to you because he's got an ego. No, no, he's, he's saying something. If I don't make that change, we will be fucked. Because like <laughs> I'm pushing way too hard on it. And he's right. going like, if you're speaking about uh, people reacting in a negative way, yeah. if it was up to me, I've still got a very uh, fictional-based uh, mindset when it comes to creating films. Mm -hmm. So I do push a little bit too hard with certain things to try, you know, I would look at it and be like, if this film was based in a fictional realm, when editing, I'm like, oh, you know, only if we had that moment. So I'd try and create that moment. But Darren's like that, you can't create that moment. It wasn't, it's not a thing. Right. So he, he looks at it completely from, uh, uh, the realism has to be there. The reality of what it is has to be that way. I can't, just I, I, I think I think this is the, you know, this is kind of the future of what storytelling has to become. And you, you said something just now that's so right. Like you want to make people cry, which sounds horrible, but mm. the reality is that if you don't evoke some kind of reaction from someone, what is the point, mm -mm. right? Mm. If you're not going to make them feel something, and it might be in, in the case of the stuff that you're making, mm. cry, but you also have equally made people laugh over the years oh, and, yeah, yeah. and make them think too, which is phenomenal. If you can make someone that you've never actually met, you've never even been in face-to-face -face contact with, yeah. feel something, that is the most amazing human capability of all. Yeah, it seems to yeah, me that yeah. that makes storytelling the magical thing that we all from when cavemen sat around a fire mm -hmm. telling each the other stories yeah. while the flames are dancing and people didn't have movies or books or mm -hmm. any kind of written language. That's the stuff that moves people. Yeah. It's an amazing thing to play with, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, like we, when I say cry, I don't mean <laughs> in a bad way. No, you don't like, mean like you're going in and punching them in the face. <laughs> no, no, no. It's like, <laughs> they, they, it's, too, they it's are tears so, of joy. Yeah. They are so absolutely captivated by what you've told them and by the, yeah. the way that they see that people's lives have been Being changed. Trans, yeah, transformation, yeah. That word transformation, I love that you've, because that's not a word I use very often, but I'm probably going to steal it from you yeah, for so yeah, much. It's, really it's a great word. It encompasses a yeah. lot more than change. It encompasses a lot more than... Um, well, it's long term. And, and it, it's so full of possibility, right? Yeah. You, because transformation is, is... You're actually taking things and they can move in this direction or in that direction. You know, it seems like metamorphosis would be the only close thing to that, but that's always the little worm into the butterfly in yeah, people's yeah, yeah, minds. Yeah. And sometimes it's the butterfly into the worm. Yeah. Tra and sometimes that's not a bad change. No, no. Right? Yeah. It's like learning to shut up. Yeah, and like, well, yeah you know. Precisely. And I, th I think like um, with, we've got two parts of when we speak about transformation, which is um, either it's to hit the donate button or sure. to subscribe or to, to share the video, which generates revenue. Correct. Or if people don't have the ability to pay towards helping out, they you change said, themselves. Do it yourself do something in your own life yeah you and it's it's insane we were um in mexico recently we we uh we did a project uh -huh. and there was a kid there that was um a part of the the organization that we were assisting and because of beast philanthropy he's he's only 10 years old he started off a club at his school and he was he was a cool kid yeah like he was one of those kids that i would be a I wouldn't have been friends with because I wouldn't have been cool enough, yeah, you know? Right, right, right. And back in my day, you were cool if you were naughty and you would do like bad shit. But he's using his coolness. He started off a club for good that supports the organization that his parents are doing. These and kids are making us look bad, man. I know, but it's big. And they, they want to impress Jimmy. Mm. They want uh, Jimmy to look at them and go, what, you know, and, and, and what's great about uh, Jimmy is he supports these the, the people that are doing this as well. And, you know, he, from time to time, you would send out a video like thanking them and whatever. And it's huge recognition for, for them to keep going. Um, and so just like- 
I love I love that we've come full circle in that discussion because when we started it was like you 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 just can't win some people over. They will just be angry with you. But you there are some people who they're just so eager to please and they're mm. so eager to make that positive difference and create the uh, the conditions for transformation. Yeah, yeah. That it balances out. In fact, there are far more of the good than there are the bad. Well, yeah, kids are are donating their tooth fairy money. It's amazing, man. We see people donating, you know, we, when we create films, we, we do have to consider the speaking in layman's terms with a lot of these things. Sure. So we do speak to the intellect, but we also speak to the, the younger audience. And when we make films about fast fashion, so we speak very, uh, would make comparisons between like how much, uh, uh, how much clothing uh, in tons goes into landfills, but then yeah. to explain that we would use like how many darrens this would mean falling on top of Jimmy's head, right? <laughs> and we would try and make this like into something comedic. And that then uh, transforms the way that a kid looks at their closet and they go, mom, I don't need 25 t-shirts. Right. You know, or when they walking and they, they want to purchase like, you know, a new pair of Yeezys or whatever. I don't, well, know, I don't know what's I going on. I have a days. feeling, and I mean, this is, I'm making this up as we talk now, but this could be why South Africans are making the impact they are in ways that Dave is with his cat stuff mm -hmm. and that, you know, that you are, um, that Darren is. It's maybe because we have this amazing access to the first world of people whose closets are full and the third world of people who have nothing, not even the closet, let alone anything mm -hmm. in it. And we can find ways to bridge those gaps, creating content in your mm -hmm. case, making the enormous transformations that you're doing for the philanthropy channel, but it, it, it's connecting these people. Mm. And isn't that the best thing about storytelling? Is that of connection? Course, yeah. We, the thing with South Africans is we have uh, the visual, uh, we have, access to the harsh realities of mm. the life that yeah, certain yeah. people have to, oh, for sure. have to live. Um, and it's happening right yeah. down the road. A couple of kilometers from here, not even meters. Yeah, and um, so you can see that and, you know, um, we have access to multiple different cultures. Mm. Um, I don't know, I think I'm, like we really live South that, that diversity is our strength <laughs> thing. We we yeah. actually live that. It's not just a slogan here. No, yeah, I I, I truly believe like even with music, like we we pull from so many different uh, cultural. We have so many benefits mm. when it comes to to. Filmmaking. Well, look at how our art is blowing up all over the world. And I'm talking about the, the, the visual arts. I'm talking about music. I'm a piano music, which is taking over. I mean, you've got guys like Black Coffee who are just absolutely destroying yeah, the market yeah. in Miami, in Ibiza, in Eastern Europe. It's, yeah, yeah. it's really our time to shine in some ways. And yeah, because we're South African, we're all humble about it. Like we, yeah, if we were Nigerian or American, we'd be so loud about yeah, all the yeah. things that are happening, of right? Of course, yeah. By the way, it has really bothered me the whole way through this interview that that chessboard is not arranged properly. Oh yeah, who I've did got that? such I've got such Matt. OCD. It's going to kill me. But listen, Wait, dude, I Matt? I am I hope this is not the last conversation because there's so many things here that we still have on the cutting room floor. But I'm I'm very aware of the fact that you know because you're a master of this, duration is everything, and I think we've kind of gone past the. The, the finish line on this. And I think your guys eventually have sat. They started standing, now they're sitting down. Yo, what happened they're almost to you, lying, They're almost lying down You're now. So I feel, stand I feel like we're abusing their hospitality and yours. But <laughs> thank you for inviting me here. It's so great to see the studio. It's fantastic to be in the company of people who are enthusiastic about what they're doing. Oh, yeah. And it's just amazing what you're actually doing. I mean, you're documenting a lot of this, but the fact that this stuff is happening in people's lives and so many people are pretending or trying to show that they're good people. Mm -hmm. I mean, Elon Musk famously said last week, he's so sick of people who want to look good but are actually doing evil. Mm. I thought that was a very powerful observation. And then there are people who are doing good and you're not even trying to look good because it just is, but you're bringing so many people along with you. Mm. Magic. 
keep doing it. Thanks. I love it, dude. Thank you, and thanks for having me here. Thank you. Amazing. It's awesome. Thank you, guys. Superb. I hope awesome. you offered some insight. Oh, no, that was there. fucking great. That was like